anyway, we're going to get into the word this morning. I've tried to be very careful and uh, intentional with my language over the last eight weeks. I always try to be intentional and careful with my language, but you've heard me say several times in the last eight weeks, especially as you were watching on your computer screen as I was sitting in my office, that what we were doing was we were connecting online, right? If you, if you picked up on that, that was the phrase I used constantly throughout our time apart, was that we were going to connect on a live stream. I was encouraging you to worship at home with the worship playlists that we provided, but I didn't talk about us assembling for the last eight weeks. I didn't talk about us having virtual worship services, and I didn't say that we were just doing church online. All of those things I, I intentionally avoided, and I used the phrase connection because There's something different about what we're doing this morning than what we did when we were all in our homes watching on our computers or phones or TVs, right? There's something different about this moment. We instinctively feel this is true. I think you feel this is true because you guys quickly signed up to be here at 9.30. This isn't the normal time we'd be gathering in this room, but you quickly signed up to be here for this because you knew there's something special about this moment. I'm not going to just be the type of person who says, you know what, man, I've got some extra time on a Sunday morning now. If I just stay home and wait for the video to get posted, that makes my life a lot easier. You knew there's something about gathering together physically in this place for this service that mattered. And so my goal in this series that we're going to be starting is to flesh out for us a solid understanding of why this moment, this gathering together, is actually different, is actually special and important rather than just remaining separated in our homes, connecting via live stream or some other digital manner. Like I said, I'm always trying to be careful with my language. And the reason I think this requires care is because I believe the Bible says there are specific things that define what a church is biblically and things that the church should do that just cannot really be done online. So the title of this new series is called Assembly Required. And hopefully as you see that phrase, if you've ever, well, I would say if you've ever built anything, but a lot of you um, know how to build things without buying them from the store and then putting them together. So you may not see the some assembly required phrase as much as like, those of us who came from the city who did not know how to build our own bookcases and we just bought them, you know, and followed directions to put them together. But if you see that phrase, common phrase, right, some assembly required, as you see that in the future, my hope is you'll think about what we're going to talk about here and why assembly is required for the church. The title of our message this morning, the first one in this series, is called The Church Gathers. The Church Gathers. So to set the stage for this series and to to help us kind of frame where we're going over the next several weeks, I want us to look at a really important text that has a very important promise in it. If you have your Bible, the text we're going to be in this morning is Matthew chapter 16, or if you open up your Logos Bible app, you can jump to Matthew chapter 16. Here's why we're jumping into this sermon series for the next several weeks together. A lot of people are asking the question, why, in the, sh- in the light of the last several weeks and all the stay-at-home orders around our nation and the radical reshaping of our daily lives and for some of us our jobs and how we function just on a, on a regular basis, in light of all of that, why does the church continue to gather physically in this post-COVID-19 world? Shouldn't we just shift to online things permanently? Why can't we just record messages and upload them? Why can't we just send emails and write blog posts and do video chats like we were doing for those eight weeks? Why is it that churches are some of the frontline places insisting we must be able to gather physically? Why is this the case. That's what I want us to answer. That's what I want you and I to be prepared for. I don't think we're going to face a lot of antagonism and hostility here where we are in, in this particular part of Missouri, part of the world, but you might be challenged by that. You might have someone say, why, why would you head to church and sit around other people and be there for a prolonged period of time and touch surfaces? Why are you taking that risk? Don't you, don't you care about people? Do you want everybody to get sick and die? Right? That, that rhetoric is common in our culture, broadly at least, and I want us to be equipped to answer that. So we're going to answer that question not just from culture, not just from preferences, not from, well, we've always done that. We're going to answer that question from the scripture, and that's what we're going to look at today. So if you're in Matthew chapter 16, let me just orient you here on where we are in the text. Matthew chapter 16 finds us looking at the ministry of Jesus as he's physically on earth, he's traveling with his disciples, 
And Matthew 16 comes after a a pretty busy season of ministry. Lots of people around, crowds are always around Jesus, public teaching, lots of things happening. But Matthew 16 gives this little window where Jesus and the disciples kind of are away from the big crowds, and there's this opportunity for some private, focused teaching, just Jesus and the disciples. And that's where we pick up on this in verse 13. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The question that Jesus poses to to his followers is he's saying, who are the people? You've been out, you've been interacting with the people. Who are they saying that I am? This is a crucial question. Who we believe that Jesus is, is really the most important question that can be answered by someone. The disciples, they kind of give him the feedback of what the people of his day are saying. What, this is what people think. This is what the, the rumors are going around about who you are. Particularly the religious Jews, that's who they'd be interacting with. Today, we would hear all kinds of different answers. We probably wouldn't hear people guessing he's John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets from the Old Testament. You might hear he's, he's a messenger of Allah from an Islam. You might hear someone who's a Mormon say he's one of the three distinct separate beings that are gods over this world. You might hear a secularist say he's just a historical figure. You might hear an atheist say he's someone who never existed. He's a myth. Today we hear a lot of different answers to that question in a lot of different ways than they heard that day. But here in Matthew 16, when Jesus asks, what are the people of this day saying about who I am? The disciples tell him what's going around, what the rumors are. And Jesus says then to them in verse 15, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? See, this is the question. How you and I answer this question, who do you say that Jesus is? That changes everything for us. We as Christians, we make a radically different confession than everyone else in this world, than every other religion in this world tells us who Jesus is. We confess what the Apostle Peter confesses in this very next verse, Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This confession is the confession that we still make today. Those of us who understand who Jesus really is, we say Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah or the Savior. Right? That's what that word means. He's the one who God had promised from the very beginning would come to save his people. He would deliver them from their sins. He would turn the wrath of God towards those sins away from the people so that they could have eternal life and salvation and relationship restored with God. He is not only the Christ, he is the Son of the living God. He is himself God who took on flesh, who entered into this broken world that you and I live in, who walked among us. He's God come to redeem his own. That's our confession. When we're asked, who is Jesus? That's how we should reply, hitting those notes. He's our Savior. He's our God. Peter makes this confession initially. He's just beginning to grasp who Jesus really is. And Jesus replies to him in verse 17. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus affirms to Peter, that is who I am. I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. And you knowing this, Peter, this is a gift that God the Father in heaven has given you. It's been revealed to you and it's been revealed to us then by extension as Jesus teaches in John chapter 6, we are his people who he knows by name, who calls us by name and reveals to us who he truly is. He knows us and we know him because the Father has revealed that to us. But all of that is just setting the context for where we are going in this series. What Jesus says next and what we're going to build out from in this series beginning today comes in the next two verses. Matthew chapter 16 verses 18 and 19. And I tell you, this is Jesus continuing to speak, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So very quickly, 
I have to hit something here because we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you need to have an explanation. This is something, these two verses here, that have had literally hundreds of thousands of pages written about it from various different views, interpreting what's being communicated here in various different ways. And in my studies, because Roman Catholicism has been a big area of study for me, I've read, I have read thousands of pages of Rome's interpretation of this text and the Protestant interpretation of this text. And what we find is a big difference. A Roman Catholic will look at this text and say, here's where the papacy started. Jesus is, is talking to Peter, and he's making him the head of the church. He's the rock that the whole church is going to be built up on, and Peter has the keys to the kingdom, and he can, he can loose people from purgatory, or he can bind them in purgatory. It's all by this power that Jesus gives Peter, and that's not at all what's really being communicated in this text. And, and I can explain this in, in greater detail, but we will not end uh, this service on time if I do that. So come talk to me if you have questions about it. If you have a Roman Catholic background, I can explain the grammatical issues, the play on words here between Peter. Peter and rock. Peter means rock, Petros, but Petra is used as a grammatical issue here in the original language. There's a textual issue because when he talks about this next in Matthew 18, where we're going to be in a few weeks, he's talking about this power that's here. It's not just given to Peter. It's given to all the apostles and the church, and we'll, we'll explore that in Matthew chapter 18. What's being said here is this rock upon which Jesus is going to build the church is not Peter. It's the confession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. That's the foundation of the church. That's what the church from that moment until now is built upon. True churches are based upon the true confession of who Jesus is. The church is not built upon Peter. It's not built upon any other leader. It's only built upon Jesus and the a true understanding of who he is. That's ultimately what creates a church, a people who are together in knowing and submitting to Jesus as our Savior and our God. And so that's brief, and I'm just touching on the surface of that because that's not the point. The point I want us to look at today is if we look at verse 18, look at the promise that Jesus makes on behalf of himself for his people. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is a really important promise for us to consider and to understand and to hear because this is actually the first time in the Gospels, if you've, if you've ever read through the Bible cover to cover, one of the good things to do is to take note when new words show up. There's something happening there when the first time a word is used. And we can see that somewhat in English, but you can see that most, of course, in the original language. This is the first time that in the Gospel accounts, Jesus uses the word that's translated for us as church. Every teaching up until this point, when Jesus is talking about God's people, he talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He uses a totally different phrase, and here is the first time that the word used, translated for us, church, is used by Jesus. Now, stay with me here. I know we're, we're talking original languages, and you're like, whoo, that's, that's a little over my head here. No, you, you can get this. Hang on, because this is going to be important as we go forward in this series. The word that's used here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 becomes the dominant word the New Testament writings will use to describe this thing that Jesus is building, the people of God. It's used 108 times directly in the New Testament to describe this thing. The underlying Greek word that we translate as church in English is ekklesia. This is what it looks like on the screen, ekklesia. The word ekklesia is a very specific word in the original Greek language. It was used in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. They translated it into Greek so people could understand it in their native tongue, like we've translated our Bible into English so we can understand it more easily. This word was used in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word kahal, which was used to specifically describe the physical gathering of God's people most often, the assembly of God's people to worship him. That's where you find this word used throughout the Old Testament. So the term ecclesia literally and directly could be translated assembly. It comes to us as church, but you could read church in the Bible. If ecclesia is the underlying word, the, the word there really is assembly. That's literally grammatically what this means. And this word, ecclesia, carries with it an implication, a requirement of a physical gathering. This is important for us to know because what Jesus is promising to build here is not buildings. What Jesus is promising here to build is not an ethereal concept. It's not an organization that exists just on paper. What Jesus is promising to build here is a physical, literal gathering of his people to worship him. That's the promise that he's making here. He's promising to build his people, a people set apart from the world, to assemble together to worship him as their God. 
So on a small scale, a very small scale, he does this through building local churches, local assemblies of his people who worship him right now in time. All around this world, there are people in local gatherings who worship Jesus. And that's what we are. We are a local assembly of God's people gathered together physically to worship him, to grow in our faith, to be equipped in here, to go out with our mission of telling others the gospel of Jesus Christ and spreading the kingdom in that way. Jesus promises and Jesus does build his church, these physical assemblies that we can see. So I think an analogy will be helpful for you here. And I put a lot of time into this. I think it'll help you understand this. And I think you'll like it because this is speaking your language a lot more than talking about Greek and Hebrew etymology and word use and all that stuff. You ready for my analogy? It's like a sports team. (laughs) Clicking, right? Like a basketball team in particular. Here's what I mean. You and I, when we think of a basketball team, we would acknowledge if you are a member of the basketball team, from the moment you go through tryouts and, and you make the team, You're on the team. You are part of the basketball team now wherever you go, right? You go home, you go to class, you're still a member of the basketball team. Once that happens, you're there. It doesn't matter where you are, you're part of the team. But when the team gets together, then something a little bit different takes place, right? Something necessary to actually being considered a team happens. When the team is truly present, gathered together physically, it's different than when the members are all spread out. When the team gathers, you can have practices, right? You can learn strategies, you can train, and you can prepare. And you can actually engage in the primary purpose for your existence if you're a basketball team, play some basketball, right? You can't do that if you're all spread out in classes. You have to, at some point, sometimes, get together physically. This is very much like what we have when we're talking about the church. This is the assembly of God's people, and it's necessary for us to do, but it's not all that we are. The basketball team doesn't only exist when they all gather together with Coach Reed. They're still part of the team when they're spread out, but something special happens, something unique is happening when they are together. So as I've said many times before here in our church, the Bible expects you and I as Christians to join a local church in a meaningful way. The Bible makes it normative that we would be identifying ourselves with a local assembly of God's people. We'd make a covenantal commitment in some way. We can put different language around that. But there's some commitment on our part to invest and serve and love and work alongside people in a local gathering of God's people and to be cared for, led by, and overseen by the, the elder, the pastors of that church, right? So there's this relationship the Bible expects all Christians will enter into with some variation around the language and how that process looks. Members of the local church then, if we're going to use our analogy, they're our teammates. They're the people who are called to the same purpose that we are called to. Their, our mission is not to play basketball, as much as Reed would probably enjoy that, right? Our mission is to go spread the gospel, and all of us share that purpose as we're called to be part of a local church. So once we're members of the local church, we're always members of the church, no matter where we are. So this is why we can say the church is not a building, the church is not a service, the church is not just this moment. The church exists even when we're out of here, and yet... Something happens uniquely when we do assemble as the corporate people. This gathering, this assembling of God's people here, it does have to happen sometimes in order for this to be something real, right? If the basketball team never gathers, then it's not really a basketball team, right? It's just a bunch of people who kind of like basketball, who say, oh yeah, we're interested in that thing, but if they never get together, if they never play, if they never try to practice, if they never do any of that, then they're not really a basketball team. And if you and I, we say, oh, yeah, we're part of the church. We're a Christian. We follow Jesus. But we never get together and do that with other believers the way the Lord has commanded, the way he's promised to build us together, then we're not really a church. The church is made up of members of that church. No matter where they are, they're always that. But these people have to assemble together sometimes in order to function fully as a local church. If there are never, never any local gatherings, then there's not truly a church there. There's no such thing as an online church. There's no assembly of the people ever. That's not a real thing. Biblically, if there's no ecclesia, that's the word used, right? There are never any physical assemblies. There's no church. The church is more than just this gathering. We are the people of God wherever we are. But this special, necessary thing has to happen to worship Christ and to be something real. 
So coming back around to this promise of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we see the fulfillment of Jesus' promises to build his church, to build his ecclesia, played out in small local pictures of his people gathering all around the world at different times regularly, physically, to worship him and proclaim his gospel just like we've done this morning. That's part of what Jesus was promising in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. <clears throat> But he was not just promising to build local churches, local assemblies, small gatherings like what we have here and there around the world. In the broadest sense, in the truest, fullest sense, what Jesus is promising in Matthew 16, 18 is to build what we call the universal church, the invisible church, or the true church. The universal church is made up of people, thank you so much, <clears throat> from every tribe, Every language and nation and time in history who are saved by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, what we sang about this morning. That true church will one day fully be seen in a future assembly. An assembly that will take place in eternity when time is no more, when all of his people are finally with him forever. On that day, the day we've talked about many times before here in this room, that we see pictured in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, 5, and 7, that full assembly that takes place there, that's the true, full fulfillment of this promise in Matthew 16. That's when it happens. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we see a picture of this. John's writing, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There is the fullest fulfillment of this promise completed. All of God's people. Brother Pedro from Guatemala, there with us. His church there with us. All of God's people across all of time from all over the world gathered together in a, in a literal assembly. Heaven's not all of us broken up into different rooms all spread out. There's a literal gathering of us around the throne of God to worship him. That's the full fulfillment of this. In eternity is the final total fulfillment of Jesus' promise to build his church in Matthew 16, 18. That happens when all his people are assembled together to worship him and praise him forever and ever and ever. That's what Jesus is promising to build here in Matthew 16, 18. That's what will succeed in its mission. This true church, this invisible church that Jesus has built will never fail, never be destroyed. does not matter how many local churches, these small pictures we have now, doesn't matter how many of these come and go in history, the universal church will never be destroyed and will never fail in its mission. So don't miss this. When we talk about the church, we talk it, about it in two ways. A universal church, an ecclesia, an assembly in eternity that we're headed towards, and we talk about it in the local level, these little ecclesias, these little assemblies that we have here on earth in specific times and locations, and we are one of these local churches to, who exist and gather now to reflect what is to come. That's part of our purpose. We gather here on earth, we assemble like this together physically to make visible a small reflection of the invisible universal church that we cannot see yet, that we cannot experience yet, we're showing those around us and we're experiencing ourselves a little picture of what eternity will be like. In our local church here, we reflect this in some great ways. We have different backgrounds in this room. We have different economic statuses in this room. We have different interests and talents and skills in this room. We have people even from different parts of the world in this room right now. And that's just a small, tiny little picture of eternity. And what binds us together in this room and what will all bind us together around the throne of Jesus in eternity is our confession that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. All true Christians make that confession. And one day in eternity we'll look around and we'll see full diversity all around us of all of God's people. And on that day we will say, he is our Christ, he is our God, and we will worship him forever. So in light of this, in light of what the church is, in light of what the word Jesus starts to use in Matthew 16, and then all the rest of the writers of the New Testament will continue to use throughout the book, in light of that term, ecclesia, in light of this understanding of something special having to exist in order to be real, this gathering, and in light of what we're reflecting from eternity into now, I hope you see it's clear we must gather. We must physically assemble together in a local context like this to be a real church. 
This has to happen. And so we should not then take this gathering lightly. This is a picture of eternity. This is not just something we do because we were raised to do it. This is us reflecting to the world something much, much greater. Something larger than just this room, just this hour. This is a picture of eternity, a small fulfillment of Christ's promise from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And so if you're not a Christian, if you're not, if you're not sure you're sold into this whole thing, then I want you to understand why we gather together in this room is not because it's just what we've always done. We gather together in this room because something real has happened, because Jesus entered into this world and promised to build this to reflect this greater reality that we're headed towards. This gathering is important to us. We're not, this isn't the only thing that defines us. There's things we have to do. We'll explore that in the next several weeks. And if we don't gather for eight weeks, we're not any less of the church, right? We're still the people of God. We're just, we're divinely hindered, as I have said. A, a, a providential hindrance kept us from gathering, but we have to at some point come back to gather. And I'm so glad that now we have reassembled to worship the Lord. And in two weeks, when the full church body is here, it will be even greater reflection of eternity to come. Let's pray together that God would help us to see this and believe this and live in light of this when we leave. And if you have questions about what it means to be part of this, come talk to me afterwards. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your love for us. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your promise that you made there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, that you chose to speak of your people, not just as a kingdom, not just as a concept, not just as an idea, but as an assembly of people who all of us who are your people have experienced love and grace and mercy, who now gather together and are unified together as brothers and sisters in this new relationship to worship you side by side. I'm grateful, God, for this gift of assembling with my brothers and sisters in this room. I'm so grateful for the chance to worship you, not by myself in isolation, but with others who have experienced your love and your mercy and grace. And my prayer, Lord, is that you'd help us to look at the church and to think about the church and to not get hung up about a building, not to get hung up on concepts and organizational structures, to get focused in on the fact that what the church is is a gathering of the people of God to worship their God and to hear from their God, and to pray to our God, and to sing to our God. That's who we are. That's why we exist. And Lord, I pray that understanding this would shape us then as we move forward. It would shape our thinking that, that this would not be something we might do on the weekend if we have the time or we have nothing else going on, that this would be, this would be the thing we long for, this picture of eternity that we would, we would desire so deeply to be in this assembly every time it meets so that we can experience in small part what we're headed towards to worship you forever. Help us then to be faithful witnesses to the importance of this gathering, to share the message of Jesus Christ, to bring others into this place. And Lord, if we're not trusting in you right now, if we're not truly part of the universal church, the true church, because we don't really have faith, don't let us become comfortable by identifying with a gathering. Don't let us think that just because we've shown up, then everything's fine. Help us to really have faith. Help us to really trust in you and believe in you and be saved by your grace alone through us placing faith in you alone, not in our actions, not in our worth, not in our works, but in you. Help us to live in light of who you are and what you've done and this promise you have made and fulfilled in part right here, right now. We love you, Lord. I pray your blessings upon my friends as they go this afternoon. Keep us safe. Help us to enjoy this wonderful day and this coming week. Help us be faithful, passionate witnesses of who you are, our Christ and our God. It's in your beautiful name we pray, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you so much for assembling together this morning. I'm going to ask you, same as we did last week, head out these ways, down the back and out to the parking lot. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Look forward to our full assembly in the near future.